I, I welcome Professor Zubin Mulla for this research seminar by Center for Wisdom and Leadership of SP uh, uh, I also welcome other guests. I welcome Gopal Krishnan sir, I welcome Parigi sir, uh, Anil Khandelwal sir, and other uh, senior practitioners. I can see uh, uh, senior professors like Professor Rajan Gupta, Professor Monika, Professor Sapna, and uh, my research scholars and colleagues. A warm welcome from Civil SP, uh, of SP Zaymar and welcome to this research seminar series. Today we have Professor Zubin Mullah, who will be talking about uh, values, the essence of leadership. Uh, let me first introduce uh, Professor Zubin Mullah to all of you. Many of you know him. Uh, Professor Zubin Mullah is a professor at the School of Management and Labor Studies at this Tata Institute of Social Sciences. He has a degree in mechanical engineering uh, and postgraduate diploma in business management. And he has a wide experience of consulting, management consulting and engineering design. From you, uh, value-based uh, leadership, transformational leadership, Trigunas. Uh, he is one of the pioneers uh, in research in Karma Yoga. And I, I'm very glad to, uh, to host this seminar because he happens to be my thesis reviewer uh, when I was doing my PhD at IIT Bombay. Uh, so uh, we have a different connection and he's always been a kind. So thank you so much, Professor Zubin, to, uh, to be here and agreeing for, for, this, uh, for this seminar. Uh, so we'll be talking about values and leadership and transformational leadership. Uh, so I welcome him once again, and uh, I request him to, to begin with the, with the seminar. All yours, sir. Uh, thanks a lot, Ajinkya. It's uh, an honor to be in this esteemed audience. I see many friends, one or two students, and uh, several people who have been mentors and guides to me uh, in my journey. Thanks a lot to the Center for Wisdom and Leadership at SPGMR also to provide me this opportunity. The study of values and leadership has been a common theme in a lot of my work, along with my mentor, uh, Professor Venkat Krishna. And this was a good opportunity for me to put everything together. When we uh, talk about leadership, just share my screen and please let me know if you can see my screen. Is the screen clearly visible? Yes, yes. Right. Thank you. When we talk about uh, leadership, most of the uh, conversations on leadership emphasize styles or behaviors. But behaviors are only visible manifestations. The true essence of leadership is in its values. Values are important for leadership in several ways. First of all, the values of the leader will predict the kind of leadership that emerges. Second, it will impact the extent to which the leader's behavior translates into positive outcomes. And finally, over a period of time, the followers' values will also change. And my central point in today's uh, seminar or webinar would be that we need to explore values in greater detail. We haven't understood this subject as much as we need to, if we really want to understand leadership. Over the course of the time allotted, I would like to address three questions. First, I will start with defining leadership and specifically focus on transforming leadership. Next, I will define values and how they are measured. I will also highlight how values are central in our understanding of leadership. Finally, I will share the findings of one of our recent studies, which I did with Professor Venkatishan, in which we looked at newcomer socialization processes in four organizations to understand how we could develop leaders having the right kind of values. If at the end of this talk, uh, several of you are in the beginning of your research journey and goal, if some of you decide to take up uh, research in the area of values and leadership, then I think my purpose will be served. So let us first start off with our understanding of leadership. Leadership is a very uh, misused and sometimes even abused term, and it can mean many things to many people. In management practice and research, the term leadership is used to mean very, very different. Things. One of the most common usages of the term of leadership is about occupying a position. So people who are in senior management roles are termed as leaders and whatever they do is termed as leadership. So there's an entire academic discipline, upper echelon theory, which talks about and even strategic leadership, 
which highlights all actions of senior management, whether man making strategy or supply chain strategy or anything that a person top management does is called leadership. That is not going to be the definition that we will be using in today's conversation. Leadership is also used to indicate high amounts of personal achievement. Someone who does very well for themselves, achieves great career success or any other kind of success is often hailed as a leader. That is again a definition that we are going to move beyond, not looking at that. If you look at both these definitions, they focus on the individual, the person, and what that individual does. The next two definitions that we talk about will now include others. So for example, another way of looking at leadership is about bringing about some kind of change in a group or a team. And one of the ways in which we talk about leadership is about exercising one's authority to bring about change. Another way of uh, defining leadership is what Burns called as transactional leadership in which we give people what is valued for them in the short term and use that in order to bring about some kind of change. And Burns also clarifies something known as transforming leadership, which is defined as achieving positive change while meeting team members' genuine needs and enabling them to grow. Now, if we look at this five ways in which the term of leadership is used, the ones in the gray zone, which is the left-hand side, uh, two types of definition are clearly not relevant because they focus only on the individual actions of an individual. They do not even consider the group. The next two, which are in the blue zone, are slightly better for us because at least they acknowledge the presence of a group or other members. And even if it means to exercise power, one has to understand the other person. Even if you need to give rewards to somebody, you need to understand what is valuable to them. To some extent, we'd say that is an improvement over the first two definitions. But the last definition of transformational leadership, as defined by Burns, talks about not just the manner in which change is achieved. It says that the change is achieved by meeting the genuine needs of the people. It also explains the direction of the change. That means we are not interested in any change in the followers. We are interested in a positive change in the followers which is where you will see the connection with values coming. So we'll be focusing on transforming leadership. Now, if we want to understand transforming leadership, if we want to talk about meeting genuine needs of people and achieving positive change, we know that even the best amongst us has not been able to achieve positive change for everyone. We may at best be able to achieve positive change over a large group of individuals if we are very successful. So hence, it is important not just to look at the personality or the individual characteristics of the leader, but focus instead on three different components. So the first is, of course, the leader demographics, individual differences, etc. Some people are more skilled at being able to inspire or bring about positive change in others. The second thing which we need to consider is the follower and the followers' individual differences. So some individuals will willingly commit to group goals, whereas others won't. Taking that into account is important in order to recognize that leadership does not reside only in the person of the leader, but also the role of the follower. And the third important thing that we need to recognize and acknowledge is the role of the context. The nature of the relationship will change. We've seen this in the case of great world leaders. While those who are hailed as great and uh, popular leaders by their, uh, by their uh, country later on lost favor when the circumstances or situation changed. So we need to look, stop looking at leadership as a static phenomenon for which we need to search in the personality of the leader and start looking at it as a dynamic relationship which lies at the intersection of these three elements, that is the leader, the follower, and the context. Once we recognize this and we move beyond the personality of the leader and recognize the dynamic relationship with these three elements, we can go ahead and define leadership as a relationship in which one individual influences another to willingly work towards a joint purpose, which transforms the group for the better. Now, here again, there are some terms in the definition which we need to recognize in order to clarify our understanding of leadership. The first is we have said it is a relationship. We are not looking at the personality traits or behaviors. While some personality traits or behaviors may well enhance the probability of such relationship forming, essentially leadership is a dynamic relationship. We recognize that at the root, it is a process of influence. Then we also recognize the role of the willingness of the follower. That means no change, however good, 
if brought about forcibly qualifies as leadership transforming leadership the change has to be brought about with the willingness of the follower that means there has to be some concern on the part of the leader to take the followers needs and values into account while bringing about the change then there is a term for joint purpose which means over a period of time the followers needs interests and values are getting aligned with those of the larger collective or that of the leader and there is also a connotation of transforming the follower for the better so we are looking at some kind of a positive balance over here it's not just any change that we are looking at but a change for the better that we are looking at so these are all several areas where values can play a role and we'll see how some of that happens the next thing we need to look at is what are values now if we look at all that we know about the world it can be largely uh, you know largely accounted for by belief systems so almost everything that we know about the world is a belief some beliefs could be validated easily and some beliefs cannot be validated there are three types of beliefs that we have there are descriptive beliefs beliefs about ourselves beliefs about others good example is the sun rises in the east this is a descriptive belief some of our beliefs are evaluative beliefs where we believe something is good or something is bad and the third kind of beliefs are prescriptive beliefs so children must obey their parents a good example of a prescriptive belief it is these prescriptive beliefs that we call as values values have a certain oughtness to them oughtness can come from moral implications it can come from aesthetic implications it can come from prudential implications that means we may say that i ought to do this or this ought to be the way things are because it is the right thing this ought to be the way it is because this is a better thing this ought to be the way things are because it is more efficient so the reason for the oughtness could be different it could also be tradition a value is nothing but a conception of how something ought to be rokich in 1968 defined values as a belief that a specific mode of conduct or end state of existence is preferable to alternative modes of conduct or end states of existence and rokich clarified that there are two kinds of values he said there are instrumental values which talk about ways of being and there are terminal values which talk about end goals of existence Now, if you look at these values carefully, you will notice that all of them are things which are important for people. All of them are valuable in that sense, which is why they qualify as values. But not all of them may be equally valuable to all people. If you look at some of the values in the left-hand side, look at the value of, let us say, being polite versus being honest. Imagine there is a supervisor who feels that it is more important to be polite and obedient rather than being honest. and that supervisor has a subordinate for whom it is more important to be honest rather than to be polite or obedient most likely these two individuals would not get along well together while both value the same things the relative prioritization of the values is different and that affects their behavior and their outcomes similarly if we look at terminal values most of us would like to have a reasonably comfortable life we would also like to have an exciting life but if an individual values an exciting life more than a comfortable life that individual's behavior will be quite different from another individual who has exactly opposite preference so these values in themselves are not going to predict behavior so much so as the relative prioritization of these values is likely to predict the behavior so we these values we say are organized in a hierarchical structure known as value system now different situations may activate different kinds of values so for example martin luther king in his well known speech where he talks about a knock at midnight he talks about a situation in 1955 when he was leading the montgomery agitation rosa parks had not given up her seat she was arrested the people of montgomery alabama during segregated times in the united states were agitating against uh, you know the reservation of seats in buses for white people and at that time when he was the leader of the agitation there was a time when some of the people in the city angry about the resistance by the black people threatened to harm martin luther king and his family even kill them 
And at that time, Martin Luther King faced a conflict between two values. On one hand was his commitment to the value of equality or justice. And on the other hand was his commitment to the value of family security. Now, both these values were important to him, but he faced a dilemma when both these values were pitted one against the other. He finally chose to go ahead with his value of justice or equality, giving family security a second priority, which is why he went on to be the great civil rights leader that he was. But this is just to highlight that individuals make decisions based on their value priorities, not just in the individual value. So it is the value priorities and rankings that are especially important when it comes to understanding how human beings behave. Later uh, in 2012, Schwartz created another framework for values, which became more conducive to research. So Rokic's initial scale was an ipsative rank order scale, which made it difficult for researchers to use it. Schwartz refined Rokic's theory to come up with a normative scale. If you look at Schwartz's theory, he arranged these values in the form of 10 values. The first one, he spoke about self-direction, which is our preference for being independent, choosing on our own. Stimulation, our preference for excitement, novelty, challenge in life. Hedonism, our interest in pleasure and sensuous gratification. Achievement, which is personal success through demonstrating competence. Power, which is dominance over others and success. Social status. Sorry. Then security, safety, harmony, and stability of self and relationships. Tradition, restraint of oneself out of regard for something which is religious or culturally required. Conformity, when one restrains one's actions in order to, for the good of the group around oneself. Benevolence, taking care of those who are close to us. And finally, universalism, which is concern for nature, humanity, animals, everything. So what we find over here is that in these 10, he could capture all the values that are important to people. The other innovation that Schwartz did was to arrange these values in a manner that values which were similar to each other were put close to each other. So for example, you notice that conformity, tradition, and security all which talk about conserving, protection, etc. are put together. Conformity and tradition are especially close because both of them require us to restrain our impulses for the sake of either one's immediate environment or for the sake of some abstract tradition that one values. Benevolence is concern for one's fellow beings, immediate family and friends, whereas universalism is concern for a larger collective. Then if you see on the left-hand top corner, you have self-direction, stimulation, hedonism, all of these talk about doing something for oneself, doing something new, uh, trying your own path and so on. And achievement and power, again, are clustered close to each other. So with this kind of an arrangement, Schwartz was able to then further classify these values along two main dimensions. The first dimension he called as self-enhancement and self-transcendence. So if you look at universalism and benevolence, it's talk about concern for others, which is why he called this as the self-transcendence to me. And if you look at hedonism, achievement, and power, he called that the self-enhancement domain. The other two domains that arise as a result of this particular classification are openness to change and conservation. So essentially, along two dimensions, these values can be then further simplified. Now, if you look at this particular framework and go back to our uh, our definition of leadership as a relationship in which one individual influences another to willingly work towards a joint purpose, which transforms the group for the better. So here, one of the things that needs to be understood is what do we mean by better or worse? Now, most cultures recognize that when we talk about transforming somebody for the better, it is about having that individual be better integrated to be, having that individual have concern for others more than concern for self. So usually, we look at any moral system, it's about having more concern for others than having concern for oneself. So one would look at, interpret this definition of better as moving towards self-transcendence as compared to merely going towards self-enhancement. Another uh, way to look at it is that what kind of values would one want in a leader? Would a person with high self-enhancement values even desire to take on leadership? 
what kind of leadership would that person exhibit? Would that individual have concern for others? So Burns's theory of transformation leadership kind of indicated that individuals with high amount of self-transcendence are more likely to be seen as leaders. Also, over a period of time, when followers are transformed, they move along the line of self-transcendence. Over the last couple of years, there have been studies which have tried to validate these two propositions of words. One is what kind of values in the leader make it more likely for leadership emergence. And second, what is the kind of change in values in the follower that we see as a result of transforming leadership? So studies have shown that transformational leadership leaders give more priority to values such as a world at peace or being responsible, which are other oriented values. Similarly, charismatic leaders by Sosik in 2005 showed that charismatic leader gave high priority both to self-enhancement and self-transcendent values. Now, this was an interesting finding. Our own study in 2011 showed that those individuals who gave higher value to being responsible, being loving, and family security were more likely to be perceived as transformational leaders by their followers. Then some studies have also looked at follower outcomes. So Shamir and others showed that over a period of time, as a result of impact of transformational leaders, followers were more likely to demonstrate sacrifice. Followers are more likely to internalize the organization's moral values. Followers are more likely to develop a collectivistic orientation, again, indicative of self-transcendence. Followers are more likely to give priority to values such as self-respect, being honest, ambitious, a lower priority to hedonism, pleasure, etc. With regard to the context also, there have been interesting studies where people have shown that individuals who represent the group's values are more likely to emerge as leaders. So when a group has a certain way of thinking, any individual who is prototypical of that group, it is more likely for that individual to emerge as a leader. Now, we've already said that individuals with high amounts of self-transcendence are more likely to emerge as leaders. We've also said that over a period of time, moral development or growth is seen as moving towards self-transcendence. So now the question is, organizations face this challenge when an individual comes from a traditionally, uh, from a student stage, moving to a corporate stage. How do we get that individual to imbibe self-transcendence values. If we want to develop values, how do we move people from achievement and self enhancement values, which they bring in as a result of their education and socialization, to more other-oriented, team-oriented, organization-oriented values? The most common process for this is organizational socialization. So we sought out to study this process of organizational socialization. So we looked at four organizations. And we have four studies, and I'll be sharing that with you. In all these four organizations, we studied people at different time periods. In one case, it was a classroom training. So we studied it immediately after the classroom training to see if the classroom training had any impact. In study two and study three, it was both on the job training. So we studied them after a larger period of time on the job. Is there any change in the values of people? And in what direction is that change? And in study four, they had a very systematically arranged, structured, a job rotation, uh, alternating between class and field, and they also had some elements of service learning. So the objective was to see how values changed in each of these four organizations, values of newcomers. So in the first organization, we found this organization had a one-month classroom training. We found that after one month, there was more convergence or similarity in values amongst the newcomers. That means people came in as a heterogeneous group, but after one month, they became more like each other, more similar to each other. Now, was this similarity that happened in direction that the company wanted, or was it in the opposite direction? Was the next question that we wanted to check. Interestingly, these individuals over a period of one month started giving more importance to hedonism, power and tradition values, and less importance to security and universal. This means, that the movement or the shift was from self-transcendence to self-enhancement, which does not seem like a good, so to speak, change if we keep 
the Burns's theory of transformational leadership in mind. In fact, the change was so drastic that for 70% of the individuals, the value hierarchies on the day of joining could not reliably predict the value hierarchies a month after them, them being on the first job. That means the correlation was not significant. You would not say that this is the same person. So huge change in values over a period of just one month. So if you see the spider diagram, it kind of represents the change in values. The red line indicates the values after one month of training, whereas the blue line represents the uh, values before training. So you notice values like benevolence have dropped down, values like power have gone up, and uh, hedonism has gone up. Universalism has also gone down. I have put a representative value ranking on the right hand side. This is just representative. Now imagine a human being for whom universalism is more important than hedonism. That means in that individual's ranking, universalism is more important as compared to hedonism. After the training, that individual's values would have been changed such that for that individual, then hedonism would be more important than universalism. So this clearly shows a shift which is not in the intended direction, even from the company's perspective. In study two, we looked at the impact on newcomers' values about one and a half years after they had been on the job. Here we found that a large number of our sample were already decayed. I mean, many people have, have quit the organization 18 months after. So we also, as a supplemental analysis, wanted to check, was there anything that the values would have predicted? So as expected, individuals who had quit were those who gave more importance to stimulation and less importance to security. So it is likely that those individuals wanted something new. And that is why they quit the organization. And they were not interested in job security or staying in that same organization. Here, we did not find any major in increase in self-enhancement in the people who had stayed back in the organization. However, here again, we found a reduction in the self-transcendence. Now, how did we explain this? Based on literature, moment people leave from campus and come to corporate, there is a feeling of social and financial independence. This is typically true in the Indian context where most of our decisions are made by our parents. They pay our fees for school, etc. And once we get into corporate life, the first time we are earning. So there is a tendency for people to feel a sense of social and financial independence, which may give rise to slight self-enhancement values. When you enter a new environment, there is a kind of a jockey for power and self-respect amongst people. Everybody has come from different places. Each one of them wants to establish themselves. So it is likely that this trigger for self-esteem could have led to an increase in the self-enhancement values when they entered a new environment. It is also likely that when they were in the organization, they heard stories of role models. Now, typically the role models that they hear stories about are those who are powerful and successful. And it is likely that these individuals want to emulate those people. And hence, they themselves increase their self-enhancement values. We also found uh, that studies had documented something called as loss of idealism. Loss of idealism happens in several professions. So professions like medicine, legal profession, these were studied. And it was found that when people enter these professions, they have values of service, taking care of people, looking after you know, uh, people and so on. But when they enter medical school or law school, etc., there is what is called as the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is something that is studied outside the classroom, when you're with your peers, perhaps in your hostel, when you talk to your seniors. And that hidden curriculum influences your values much more than the formal socialization program of the uh, institute or in this case, the organization. So it is likely that even in these organizations, there was some kind of a hidden curriculum which led to loss of idealism. So even though in the classroom program, the intention of the organization was to bring in uh, self-transcendent values like teamwork, etc. What actually happened was that people, students were uh, or uh, fresh and newcomers were more influenced by the hidden curriculum of what their seniors spoke about or the role models who were powerful and successful. And this led to the change in values from self-transcendence to self enhancement it could also be that there had there were some personal experiences that people went through 
and those personal experiences were uh, likely in shaping the change in values. In the third organization, we had again an on-the-job socialization program and we had an opportunity to study the people the day they joined and after seven months of them joining the organization. Here we found that there was no convergence in values amongst the group of newcomers. Now notice in the classroom training program, there was a convergence in values. People became more similar to each other, but the overall shift was not in the direction of what the company wanted. In this case, we found that there was no convergence in values. People were as heterogeneous after seven months as they were on the date of joining. In effectively, there was no socialization, especially as far as values is concerned, because there was no change in the values in any, uh, uh, any convergence as such. However, across the group, there was less importance given to self-transcendence. Again, a shift in an undesirable direction. There was more importance given to values such as self-direction, hedonism, and achievement, and less importance given to values like conformity and universal. So if you look at the overall uh, diagram, we find here that, uh, again, the blue line represents before values and the red line represents after values. So we see the dip in universalism. We see the increase in self-direction. We see the increase in hedonism and we see the increase in uh, achievement values. If we were to see representative, average values of the group, if you look at the value ranking hierarchy, the relative prioritization of universalism versus hedonism has completely reversed. So if a person entered and that person initially believed that universalism is more important to him or her as compared to hedonism, by the time those uh, seven months of on-the-job socialization were over, that person would have exactly the opposite belief. And that person would believe that hedonism is more important than universalism. In this case, we also had an opportunity to study the managers of this uh, particular group. So we uh, dug a little deeper. We found that when we split the group based on the manager displaying transformational leadership behavior, so we measured the manager's transformational leadership behavior. We also measured the manager's values. The logic here is that when you are in an on-the-job socialization, you are not in a classroom. So the most significant individual in your life is your immediate supervisor. When you are having any doubts or confusion as to how to act in this new organization, you look at your manager for guidance. And whatever is his or her behavior, that becomes a role model for you to behave in a particular way. So we dis divided the sample into two groups. Newcomers whose supervisors did not display transformation leadership or displayed less amount of transformation leadership and newcomers whose supervisors displayed high amounts of transformational leadership behavior. And we found a very interesting pattern over here. So if you look on the left hand side, newcomers whose supervisors did not display transformation leadership, you find that benevolence values have reduced, achievement values have increased, power values have increased. This is just what we had seen in the classroom training and in study two in the on-the-job training. On the other hand, newcomers whose supervisors displayed transformational leadership behavior showed a slightly different pattern. One is they did not show any significant increase in either achievement or power values. And when we looked at the value systems in terms of the ranking, if you look over here, this switch between universalism and hedonism is there amongst the newcomers whose supervisors did not display transformational leadership behavior. We also find a switch between benevolence and achievement values, which means if an individual early, earlier thought that it's more important to look after my team and family as compared to my personal achievement, after it is exactly the opposite. These individuals thought that achievement is more important than looking after my team and family. On the other hand, for newcomers whose supervisors displayed transformational leadership, you find that there was no such shift in these values. What this meant was that for the newcomers whose leaders displayed transformational leadership, it was like a vaccine against the normal change in values, which would happen from 
self transcendence to self enhancement it was almost as if transformation leadership was able to check that particular deterioration we further tested uh, using a regression analysis a person's values at the end of the training period the best predictor of those values is the values of that individual prior to the training period so we use that as a control variable the values prior to the training period are a predictor of the individual's values after the training period and then when we add transformational leadership in the regression equation we find that transformational leadership enhanced self transcendence values that means as a result of transformational leadership followers became more heavily interested in other oriented values we find that transformational leadership was negatively related to self enhancement values which means that those individuals who had managers who displayed transformational leadership they became less concerned about self enhancement and more concerned about self transcendence the interesting thing was that transformational leadership had no impact on openness to change and conservation values we felt this was an important validation of james burns's argument that transformational leadership over a period of time increases followers moral development now if we agree that moral development means thinking more about others and being high on self transcendence then it is quite clear in this case that transformational leadership enhanced followers self transcendence and reduced followers self enhancement but at least in our data did not have any impact on openness to change and conservation values now why does this happen when newcomers are inspired by people those individuals become their role models and over a period of time they try to align their values with the values of the supervisor followers of transformation leaders identify with the leaders and over time they achieve greater value congruence so this was another thing we wanted to test for so we looked at value congruence at time 1 and we added transformational leadership to the regression here we found that transformational leadership enhanced value congruence at time 2 what that means is followers became more similar to their managers over a period of time especially when their managers displayed transformational leadership behavior we felt this was an important finding because in the context of newcomer socialization having a good first boss seems to be an important predictor of the kind of changes that happen to the individual over a period of time now look at the fourth study the fourth study had quite different findings from the earlier three studies in the fourth study uh, they had a structured job rotation program so they did not have either classroom training or only on the job training their training was a combination of individuals going to different units and looking at different managers they alternated between going to the field and a classroom interaction and they also had an element of service learning in their induction program in this organization we found that again there was no convergence in the values in the group of newcomers the heterogeneity remained the same after one year of training the newcomers gave less importance to power values and scored lower on self enhancement which means that this organization was effectively able to transform the newcomers they were effectively able to transform the newcomers and move them higher on self transcendence the values of the role models marginally affect the val values of the newcomers so when they met role models in different organizations that did affect different units of the organization it did affect the values and their values were closer to the ideals of the organization which again talked about teamwork etc so if you look over here you will find that in this organization you have a very interesting kind of a diagram where the red line which represents the values later you have lesser emphasis on power values lesser emphasis on achievement values and higher emphasis on benevolence values now why did this happen based on our interactions with this group we figured out that 
This happened because of a couple of reasons. One is that when they had exposure to different contexts and different managers, it was not one manager which was predominated. In study three, when people went in the field and they had one manager, that one manager mattered or not. If that manager displayed transformation leadership, then they moved along desirable lines. If the manager did not display transformation leadership, the movement was deteriorated. Here, because they had exposure to different managers, they were able to see different managers behaving differently and they could actually see which one was better. And perhaps they emulated those whom they were inspired by. The second point, alternating between the field and the classroom is also important. Once you're in the field, that becomes your reality. But if people are given an opportunity to come back from the field from time to time, be in the classroom, see the experience that others have got, it helps you to moderate your own experience. If your experience has been very good, very bad, making sense of that experience is possible. When you listen and talk about your own experience, talk, listen to the experiences of others, talk about your own experiences. And the last one is service learning. Now, this has been found in several other studies also that working with underprivileged people, working with uh, NGOs, etc., is one of the best ways of uh, enhancing self-transcendence values. So this organization uh, seemed to have got it right. So putting it all together, what are the implications of uh, this research uh, for theory and practice? In terms of theory, one is organizations need to be careful of the hidden curriculum when influencing the values of newcomers. Studies of newcomer socialization have still not taken care of this hidden curriculum. Most of them uh, look at uh, management practices. What is it that the organization does during the newcomer socialization in order to change the outcomes for the uh, uh, newcomers? But more studies need to take into account this hidden curriculum, something that happens beyond, behind the scenes when the newcomers are not going through a systematic process. That has to be then incorporated into the research on newcomer socialization. Impact of the supervisor's transformational leadership behavior on newcomers' values and moral development, I think, is an important theoretical implication. More studies need to look at this and uh, refine it further. In terms of practical implications, when we design newcomer socialization programs, at least based on my study, the best mix seems to be on the job and classroom alternating so that people can make sense of what is happening on the job and uh, the classroom can be used in order to give them perspectives and frameworks, coupled by service learning. And the last practical implication is enhancing the supervisor's transformational leadership behavior will go a long way in positively influencing newcomers' values. Just as one would not put one's children in the hands of anybody else except someone who you trusted, Organizations must take particular care. Some organizations do it, but most of them don't think too much. If organizations want to develop leaders for the future, one of the best ways to do that is to ensure that the newcomers are allotted to supervisors who are likely to display the right kind of values and the right kind of behavior. It is only then will that they will be uh, moved along the self-transcendence or the direction that you want them to. So finally, uh, there are some questions which uh, need further exploration because uh, this was a very small study, not a very large sample, but more studies need to be done in this area. One of the things that uh, we need to look at is what is the role of an individual's values in predicting leadership emergence and leadership effectiveness? There is a tension between self-enhancement values and self-transcendence values. If we go back to the definition of leadership, one of the things we talked about was influencing others. So there has to be some extent a concern for others. But to even get into a position to influence others, one needs to have some kind of self-enhancement values. Imagine a person who has got only self-transcendence values and no self-enhancement values. I feel it may be difficult for that individual even to reach a leadership position. So this is a paradox. Now, most of our studies have been quite linear. 
where we are measuring only one value at a time. But a combination of these two values at a time to be measured is something that any new study should uh, anticipate. Another thing that we should perhaps look at is a temporal separation between the values. So it may not be true that the same value may be important across the career of the individual. And the initial stages of the career, it is likely that some amount of self-enhancement values may actually help the individual to grow in their career and reach a position in which that individual can influence others. However, once the person has reached that position where one can influence others, that is the time self-transcendence values are needed. Now, this is a little bit of a paradox and for practice as well as for theory. So not too much of our research looks at this kind of temporal separation as to at one stage, one is needed and another stage, something else is needed. So if we could do that kind of a longitudinal study where we see how the values, different values are needed at different stages of one's career, then perhaps we could be able to see this. We also need to look at mechanisms of value change in team members. What is the process by which leaders change the values of the followers? So far, Milton Lokic's study talks about a couple of methods. So he talks about value confrontation. That means when you want somebody to change their values, you confront them with the hypocrisy between what their belief systems are and what their actions are. And the chances are that they may change their values. Another way of value change is to use what is called as crucibles, put people in positions where they face tough choices. And while facing those tough choices, they kind of forge their identities, shape their values. Something like we spoke about in the case of Martin Luther King uh, in 1955 when he was part of the Montgomery agitation. And he was forced to trade off between his family and his value of equality and justice. And by choosing the value of equality and justice in that particular dilemma trade-off, he became more convinced, he shaped his identity as a leader in that context. So organizations can create such kind of crucible experiences, may not be of that level of severity, but of smaller severity, where in, uh, potential leaders are put through such kind of tough dilemmas or decision-making, where they kind of shape their values. And that could be one mechanism of value change. Another mechanism of value change has been documented by a scholar, Sean Martin, where he talked about the role of stories in bringing about changes in values. And interestingly, who the story is about matters a lot when it comes to value socialization. So very often organizations during socialization give stories of senior managers, senior managers of what they did and how they enhance the values of the organization. But Martin uh, study found that it was not so much the stories of the senior managers that affected the values of the newcomers. It was more the stories of the immediate senior batch which affected the values of the newcomers. That means the newcomers for them, the role models were not the old senior managers, but their immediate senior batch. So if you want to tell stories to the newcomers while socializing them, tell them stories about what their immediate batch had done to enhance the values of the organization. But we need to have more understanding of how these mechanisms happen. What are the mechanisms by which values change in individuals? This is something that needs to be better understood. The last thing which I feel we need to look at in more detail is the validation of values and value systems based on Indian cultural belief system. To give you an example, if you look at... Uh, the classic Rokic value survey, which is, uh, which is there in almost all uh, OB textbooks. There is one value which they talk about ambitious. Now in that value of ambitious, they explain that value as within brackets, they use the term aspiring and hardworking. If you look at our Indian context, just because you're aspiring for something doesn't mean you're hardworking. And just because you're hardworking, you may not be aspiring. So there is a, a cultural assumption over there that uh, an individual who is hardworking has to be ambitious. We did a small study in the Indian context and we showed that this value need not always go together. In an Indian context, 
person could be hard working without being ambitious out of a sense of duty or obligation towards uh, an individual or an employer so there would be so many other such values which may be relevant in the indian context but which are not well captured by either rokich or shorts and there is a need for us to develop something like this in the indian context i had read a paper somewhere where somebody recommended looking at purusharthas as a kind of a value system for the indian context but i think more systematic work needs to be done on that needs to be developed further than that this brings me to the end of my presentation uh, i need to thank a couple of people one is professor venkat krishnan for partnering in this study and co-authoring the paper based on which uh, the newcomer socialization part of the study is talked about uh, professor rajan gupta and professor es shrinivas had been mentors uh, during the study and uh, this research was funded by uh, aon uh, think tank research scholarship which was a industry consortium which had got together uh, to fund research for some people in india so i'm open to questions uh, i hope uh, this presentation has uh, made you value values and uh, recognize that it is almost impossible to uh, understand leadership without understanding that thank you so much professor for uh, uh, this very interesting presentation uh, i uh, we open this forum and uh, we request participants to to ask questions if you have please uh, raise your hand and you can unmute yourself and ask question directly well, it's it's a very small group so we can have this uh, uh, informal discussion we can say just a clarification question i am i am following your work on zoom in uh, on values so uh, i have been also one of the beneficiary of your literature review and the research studies so but uh, just a clarification the last uh, the last the fourth organization was was the background of these organizations was same or different it was different i could not get four similar organizations in fact even the time period was slightly different it was not the same okay okay so the fourth organization was in which sector it was in the hospitality sector it was in the hospitality and which were the other uh, three sectors the first one uh, was an engineering organization the second one was a bank the third one was an automobile industry and the last one was a hospitality hospitality sector mm. so i think we could expected similar finding in the bank and the hospitality but there was a difference and that can be attributed to the the mode of uh, socialization process absolutely. ever adopted absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. thanks thanks anyone would like to share yeah, yeah. yes sir so uh, sir you talked about the four uh, the studies that you have done so these were the field studies so you had to collaborate with the organizations and then yes, yes. we had to partner with the organization uh, we reached out to them they gave us permission uh, in most of the cases we collected data on the day the candidate had joined the organization on the first day the candidate joined the organization and then after either one month or seven months depending on what was feasible at that time and what was the size of uh, participants for the studies so it was different in each case because depending on how many people joined that organization so in the engineering organization we had uh, 244 people okay in the bank when we started we started with a large sample we ended up with about 60 people because almost half of them had gone away by the time we collected the second round of data in the auto company we had about 200 people who joined the organization and we stayed with them and in the hotel and uh, hospitality industry it was 45 okay ajay kya can i ask a question uh, sorry am i supposed to put up my hand uh, no, no please ask no, no, yes no a very yes, small please, group it's a very small group please ask uh zubin bhai have you written this up as a paper Yes, which is and I've common it. common I've... common people like me can understand and not academically high qualified people. You know yes, there are at least listened. there are at least two people here, Mr. An, my good friend Anil Kandelwal, uh, former chairman of Bank of Baroda, and Dr. myself. Dr. Kandelwal is academically qualified. Yeah, 
but I, I said his name as an intermediate between academic people and my. But is it written up as a paper and is that available for me to see, Ajinkya? Yes. yes. You'll possible to circulate it. Yeah, sure. I'm okay. It, it is open access actually. Okay. Ajinkya will help me with that. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yes, definitely. Appreciate it. You can Very put up the reference as well here in the chat box. Pardon? Ajin can put, put up the reference uh, of the paper as well. Yeah. 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 In okay. so it's an so, open access. Uh, Jivin, can I ask a question? Yes, of course, sir. Please ask. Yeah, man. Wonderful yeah. to see you. Yeah. So, uh, are you able to see me? Yeah. Very well. Very okay. Well. <laughs> so, from a, uh, I, I, I'm. Uh, I'm in the category of Gopal. Uh, we are practitioners <laughs> and uh, practitioners have different sets of questions. One thing that I have found that uh, uh, looking at people who work with us, that the values are not stable. They keep changing. I found a couple of guys towards the end of retirement the value shift is very dramatic. That uh, there are anxieties with regard to settling down. There are anxieties with regard to many other commitments. And towards the end of career, in financial industry, I found people become vulnerable to many enticements. Uh, I have seen some of them maintaining certain degree of value system, the highest level of integrity, honesty, but the, the retirement period is a slippery slope of values. And uh, especially uh, in public enterprises where the top management gets paid very uh, less, meagerly. And then uh, when they have to compete post-retirement, they're concerned for maintaining certain standard, maintaining. So in some cases, uh, these things. So what is, what is it that for 50 years, 55 years, someone maintains a certain value system and then because of security, safety, and other things, people try to, and then there are opportunities that can really uh, entice. So is there, uh, has your research found out that at, at what stage of life the value gets really uh, get fixated like a nut and bolt? that you can't move from there, or they are always, you know, uh, uh, I don't know whether you understand what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I got what you said. So uh, most of the uh, research talks about values as being relatively enduring. Mm -hmm. They are relatively enduring goals of life. Yeah. That is one uh, thing. The other thing is that these relatively enduring goals, they do change during significant life events. Significant life events are usually, let us say, uh, death of a loved one or, for example, a drastic change in one's uh, uh, life situation. Let us say, moving from organization, uh, moving from campus to corporate or retirement could be one such stage in one's life. So one has to investigate this. So far, I have not seen retirement related studies, uh, but one needs to investigate this further. It is also possible that when we talk about the value, value behavior linkage, the value behavior linkage is subject to interpretation by the individual. What that means is whether or not you interpret a situation as uh, impacting your values or not depends to what extent you will act in that direction. Now, sometimes, uh, let us say uh, I am used, used to traveling without tickets. And then you, who, who are my friend, you tell me, that Zubin, you are otherwise such an ethical person. Why is it that you're traveling without ticket? Now, that situation of traveling without ticket, which I used to do almost automatically, now I have started interpreting it in the light of my values. 
So between values and behavior, there are many in between things. So one is this interpretation. The other thing, which is a uh, like a uh, which comes in between values and expression of values in terms of behavior, is external control. Sometimes what happens is when the external control is very high, you cannot express your values. Suppose I am in an organization which has a very strong culture, then my values will not find expression. When that external control is removed, that is when my values will find expression. In the retirement case, I am guessing that could be one thing. So that individual perhaps now finds that nobody can get after him or her because they are about to retire. I am guessing. I don't know whether that is the case. Huh? Uh, and that could be one reason why now suddenly they are expressing their values. This could be one. Another thing could be they could have come to a realization based on the life stage, maybe funding the children's marriage, maybe funding the children's education, maybe some other event may have happened when that person in at midlife starts reassessing what they have lived their life and maybe a sense of regret or remorse at having spent their life in that organization or having felt that that organization has let them down looks at this as a particular, uh, you know, as a, the organization has let me down and hence I, I feel justified in getting back at the organization. This could also be one of the reasons. This is just <laughs> conjecture. So I, I once wrote an article on uh, you know, these, uh, the salary uh, of uh, bureaucrats and uh, you know, Chanakya and Kautilya, uh, Kautilya had given a framework of how much bureaucrats should be paid. And I found that what our bureaucrats are currently being paid is substantially lesser than what Chanakya had recommended. So Chanakya had given an interesting analogy. He said, you know, so much rice should be given to the lowest member of the bureaucracy. And then he gave multiples of how much each person up in the bureaucracy should be given. And if you see what our bureaucrats are paid today, substantially lesser than that. And of course, it's substantially lesser than the corporate sector also. So it is possible that there is some kind of a angst in the mind of each of these individuals. And some of them may be succumbing to the temptation as a result of that. But this is conjecture. I have not studied this at all. But somebody needs to... No, it's a very, very fascinating... Indian -centric, this is a very Indian-centric issue, actually. A very fascinating concept. I think this needs a lot of exploration in Indian context. Because there are professions which are known to be, let us say, police, tax department. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, to what extent... Uh, 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 they are infamous, everyone knows, you know. Yeah. There are certain jobs, best of the people go, they get, uh, you know, they get into it. So uh, it's a very fascinating subject, but requires a lot of uh, Indian, uh, India-based research on longitudinal basis. Uh, this one-time statistical research uh, is important. But uh, uh, I think a lot of longitudinal studies are required in regard to uh, various professions and also comparative public sector, private sector. And, and what do you talk about politicians' value system? Uh, I mean, it's ever changing. So anyway, uh, I don't want to elongate the discussion, but then a very fascinating subject. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, sir. Uh, may I come in? Yes. Sir. So, Zubin, great to attend your presentation. Uh, excellent summary of four studies. And um, uh, I'm not able to see you zoom, uh, zoom in now. What happened? I think there was a phone, so it may be showing only a few of the... Okay, okay. So, however, I will do wish to make a comment uh, that uh, what you have presented is hardly about leadership. Except in organization three, where one may say, okay, there was at least a manager uh, who came into play. Otherwise, uh, I don't see your, your studies really studying leadership. They are only studying values in the Indian context and especially the entry level. And, uh, and uh, so that to me, uh, uh, 
professor uh, you are right this latest study which i shared talked about newcomer socialization and out of the four organizations uh, i could collect data on the managers only two of the four organization 3 and organization 4 okay uh, there is another study which we published in 2011 where we looked at uh, the values of the manager and the values of the follower and, i have read uh, that i am familiar uh, thoroughly familiar the, <laughs> yes so one of, paper, best, uh, looked, one of the earliest uh, earlier earliest studies on you know transformational leadership in india yeah. your your paper was i am an admirer of that paper <laughs> so that we had done earlier this we yeah. looked at the newcomer socialization and yes. uh, only two of them we could get data from the managers mm -hmm. right right okay that's all thank you thank you sure yeah okay, i have one question uh so when you have worked in karma yoga and you have also looked at uh, its impact on transfor transformational leadership so i'm just curious to know that uh, do you see any link, link in this study link of karma yoga in this study uh, in context of transformational leadership so uh, again there was another paper where uh, you know we looked at karma yoga and transformational leadership and it was a predictor of transformational leadership it was also an outcome so transformational leaders make team members more duty oriented etc in this study we did not measure uh, uh, karma yoga though in one of the studies uh, we did measure gunas but that is a separate uh, paper okay okay great so anybody else would like to ask a question or share a thought oh yeah uh, i would like to say something like one of the studies you mentioned that uh, they were more uh, changed by their story of the peers rather than the leader so you yeah their immediate immediate one year senior to that yeah. yeah so i think somehow i i'm i have a feeling that it can be because they can identify with the peers more than the leader Absolutely. so maybe it is the identity which uh, so uh, value can have a relationship with the identity and the role the person has in so yes. yeah that that may be one reason and that's yeah. a good paper it's an amj paper uh, by okay. sean martin s e a n sean martin yes very well written and uh, i think we need more such work. okay and i'd like thank you for your presentation and it was really nice that to have you here thank you one small question you will yes sir. what is on your plate so currently i am trying to uh, work on the gunas uh, material that i have put together i have collected some data trying to put it all together okay and uh, one of our uh, with one of my students we developed a scale for measuring gunas okay uh, based on uh, attitude towards social issues so we are looking at gunas in a slightly wider perspective mm -hmm. that uh, not just about what food you like or other things but mm -hmm. uh, gunas as the way you look at social issues so one way of looking at social issues is being indifferent to them that it doesn't matter to me one way of looking at social issues is to be quite you know fanatic about it and you know i need to stop it and some evil force is there and into demolish it which we call as the rajas approach and one way of looking at social issues is the satvik approach where i'm going to fight but i'm going to be calm and i'm going to try to improve myself while i change the environment around okay that reminds me jubin i don't know since you are working on this uh, one of my favorite books uh, its title i remember i forget the name of the author <clears throat> tempered radicals okay i should look wonderful at this. yeah wonderful book by an american professor about <clears throat> so they sound similar to your satvik uh, people okay yeah they be moved i, I will just... send you the paper the first in that series of gunar paper is one of them has just got published I okay okay thank you yeah so thank you very much uh, professor zubin for uh, for this wonderful Sajin. talk uh, we are very happy to to host you i thank uh, all uh professors professor rajan gupta professor monika uh, other faculty colleague professor sushmita professor sapna uh, professor subhashree and other people who joined this talk 
I also thank uh, senior industry leaders like uh, Parigi sir, Gopal Krishnan sir, uh, Kandelwal sir, and all who joined. I thank, yes, uh, sorry, you want to uh, yeah. say uh, something? Thank you, Zubir. Uh, you know, I'm very excited to, as a pure and simple practitioner over several years, to listen to the analytics framework. And uh, my interest after being a corporate revenue profit seeking animal for 30, 40 years, and been lucky in life, Radio Mirchi has been a global brand. Times Out of Home is a global brand. Companies I started within the Times of India from scratch, the underdog to the super dog, okay? And I'm so, so uh, interested that when I do visit Bombay once a month, I'll drop by and share what little I've learned in the last 20, 30 years uh, and uh, share some ideas which may provoke a couple of multilinear dimensions for your study on the context of transformational leadership. Because when mobile telephony came to India, I had the privilege of being one of India's eight CEOs to run the eight metros. And I'll just share one little nugget that will keep all of you awake. None of India's CEOs, I repeat, none of Indian CEOs other than State Bank of India, ONGC and BHEL have ever signed a check for two, 3,000 crores with a single signature. I repeat, none of the CEOs of great esteem and great have ever signed checks other than BHEL, ONGC, you know what I'm saying, SBI. And we had that opportunity of signing 5,000, 8,000 crores, 10,000 crores, because I was in a category which was new to India called telecommunications, having been the CEO of BPL Mobile Mumbai. And then when I moved away to media and entertainment and did Mirchi, Radio Mirchi, uh, I really found that my interest now, maybe I'm getting older at the age of 74. How do I bring in, I'm just jumping the gun, how do I bring in value into managers? Is something I'll come and call on you sometime whenever convenient and share these dimensions because that's the reason when one of the scholars from the Institute said, wow, Mr. Parigi, you should attend this. I said, let me, let me attend. And I, believe me, I'll, I'll track what you're doing. And, uh, share some ideas. I hope it can help in a multi-linear framework. And my other suggestion, if I may be permitted, and I'm very new to all of you is that the, the age of the leader, demographics and background, the age of the organization. Point number two, three, the maturity of the organization in its industry. So if you're in telecom, how mature is the telecommunication company running in the overall global telecom like Airtel, Vodafone, et cetera? Where are you? So, you're a CEO, fair enough, but, but it's a global game. Where are you? Yeah. And if you do a startup in a large corporation, how do you start when you have no status? Somebody is doing 8,000 crores and you're doing five crores. So how do you attract talent? And what is that kind of leadership to ensure attrition is lowest in the industry and maybe in the world, in media? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I can only share what I know. But sure, we'll be happy to connect. Yeah, it will become multilinear, as you rightly said. So I feel that the, the, this is a subject, but I'm more keen on learning from all of you, and particularly you, is, uh, is that somewhere, uh, you know, when we all do our MBAs and come out, how do we get that? Compassion, I'm using a very simple non man compassion. And I've noticed wherever I've taken executives to meet the underprivileged quite often, 
and without preaching, because this generation do not like to preach. They don't like to be told what to do. But when you start taking them on these rural trips, which I think many organizations do, I do see a little bit of a problem. That is what uh, this study also showed, uh, the service learning. Yes, that I saw it. that. You used it as service learning is a vocabulary. That's the term we use. In very, very nice. I am a great believer in that. And uh, thank you for uh, putting, uh, sharing. I know there's much more than you can do in 45, 50 minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Aditya. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Parigi, sir. And uh, we will be happy to connect with you also because we will have many more speakers coming every month sure. and we'll be happy to have people like you attending the sessions and giving more insights uh, from 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 industry and that that is the very purpose of this this uh, research seminar series that we want to bring researchers and industry practitioners together so that there will be some interaction exchange and churning of ideas around wisdom values and and leadership uh, next month, we will be having Professor Dharam Bhauk uh, to present his uh, research on Sadhu Mark. Uh, he defines Sadhu Mark as an Indian way of living and leading. Uh, professor Dharam Bhauk is, is a professor uh, uh, in cross-cultural psychology at uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa. And uh, he is uh, one of the authority in uh, Indian scriptures and, and bringing it in uh, cross cultural psychology and management, and we'll be talking about Sadhu Mark. So, I, inv uh, I extend invitation to all of the participants that please do join us next month, and you will receive the update around uh, of that research seminar in the next month. And we'll be happy to, to see you in the next one. So, thank you once again to everyone, and we will we'll be happy to meet again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ajinkya. Bye. Thank you. Bye.